One of the reasons we're concerned with the three-dimensional geometries of molecules is that it's an important indicator of whether the molecule's electron distribution as a whole is symmetric or not. And if the distribution of electrons is not symmetric, we're looking at a polar molecule potentially. Molecules that are polar have peculiar properties, particularly as they relate to intermolecular forces, as we'll see a little bit later in the course. So here we're going to connect molecular polarity with molecular geometry, allowing us to infer polarity from the three-dimensional structure of a molecule. To begin, I want to return back to the idea of electronegativity and the polar covalent bond. Bonds that link atoms of different electronegativity have a non-zero bond dipole moment. When we say dipole moment, we're referring to a separation of charges in space. The magnitude of the dipole moment is equal to the product of the magnitude of the separated charges, which we represent here as capital Q, and the separation distance between them, little r. Now, we typically don't use this equation to calculate the magnitudes of dipoles in any given situation. We let a computer do that for us if we need to do a calculation. More often than not, we represent the dipole as a vector pointing from the positive side, the positively charged side, to the negatively charged side of the dipole. And a bond dipole points along the axis that connects the nuclei involved in the bond, the internuclear axis. So notice that these dipole vectors are parallel to the bonding axes of CH and BF here. In these bond dipole vectors, we use the head of the arrow to represent the region of negative charge and the tail of the arrow with a little cross to represent the region of positive charge. And that's true of both of these bond dipoles, which happen to point in opposite directions because of the differences in electronegativity. If you think back to our discussion of electronegativity, you can rationalize and predict the directions of these bond dipole vectors. That's going to be an important skill in predicting molecule polarity. We can also represent dipoles using delta plus and delta minus symbols to show the regions of partial positive and partial negative charge. And these bond dipoles are really the inputs to thinking about molecular dipole moment, the dipole or the polarity of the molecule as a whole. The molecular dipole moment is a vector sum of all of the bond dipoles. So to determine molecular dipole moment, we first determine the directions and rough magnitudes of all of the bond dipoles, most importantly whether all the bond dipoles are the same or different in magnitude. And then we do a vector sum of all of those bond dipoles to determine the molecular dipole moment. And the molecular dipole moment reflects the separation of charge in the molecule as a whole. Or put another way, it reflects how asymmetric the distribution of electrons is within the molecule. Let's look at two examples of molecules that are nonpolar and polar. The molecule on the left is CO2. It does contain two polar bonds with two non-zero bond dipoles represented by these bond moment vectors right here but they point in equal and opposite directions. So when we add them together, the overall dipole moment is equal to zero. This makes the molecule as a whole nonpolar. It has a zero dipole moment overall. Water, on the other hand, has a non-zero overall dipole moment. Since the two polar bonds in water both point in a net upward direction, as it's drawn here, so that the vector sum of the two bond moments is going to be non-zero and pointed in an upward direction. For that reason, and because this is a pretty substantial overall molecular dipole vector, water is called polar. It's a polar molecule with a profoundly asymmetric distribution of electrons, with more negative charge near the oxygen and more positive charge near the hydrogen. Now, it's worth mentioning here that if we're dealing with nonpolar bonds, pure covalent or nearly pure covalent bonds in the entire molecule, we also consider the molecule as a whole nonpolar. And this is the kind of thing that can vary from instructor to instructor, situation to situation. But throwing back to our classification of covalent bonds as pure covalent versus polar covalent from earlier, I'm going to say that if the difference in electronegativity is less than 0.4 for all the bonds in the molecule, you're looking at a nonpolar molecule overall, 
even if there is a slight bond dipole associated with some of the bonds. So something like a hydrocarbon, propane, you know, C3H8, we're going to think about as a nonpolar molecule overall, even though it may contain some slightly polar CH bonds. Molecular polarity is a key concept for bridging the submicroscopic level of single molecules and the macroscopic visible world of moles and moles of molecules. Molecular polarity has a predictable and relatively easily explainable effect on macroscopic properties. For example, the idea of like dissolves like. Polar substances tend to be soluble in other polar substances, and nonpolar substances tend to be soluble in other nonpolar substances. Like dissolves like. So pol polarity is sort of correlated with solubility. You can place polar molecules in an electric field, and they will be affected by that electric field. They will orient themselves in that electric field. We're seeing that here. These HCl molecules are aligning themselves so that their positive ends are near the negative plate of this capacitor, while their negative ends are near the positive plate of the capacitor when an electric field is applied across the, the capacitor. And finally, and most broadly, Polarity is profoundly related to the strengths of intermolecular forces. Having these partial charges in the form of an overall molecular dipole moment in the molecule opens the door to electrostatic attraction across molecules, what we call intermolecular forces. And we'll explore these in more detail in a future video series and understand how these relate to things like melting point, boiling point, vapor pressure, and other macroscopic properties of solids and liquids.